Continuing our journey in chapter 12, we're going to start talking about integrated rate laws and their relationship to half-lives. And so there's your learning outcomes and expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those before we dive into the content. All right, so integrated rate laws. And so we've taken this journey, we talked about defining reaction rates, molarity per second, factors affecting those rates, and then we talked about rate laws, right? The proportionality between rate and concentration as dictated by the rate constant of the reaction. And so we talked about orders of reaction. And so for a reaction of A turning into B, we're gonna see A disappear over time. And this graph shows time and that's A. And we're gonna see A go away. But depending on the nature of the reaction, it's gonna go away at different rates. Right, and that rate is going to be dictated by the order of the reaction. And so if we have a zero order reaction with respect to A, rate is equal to K. If we have a first order reaction, rate is equal to K A to the one, second order rate is equal K to the two. And so again, depending on how the, uh, what the rate law of the reaction is, how the mechanism actually proceeds, you get different changes in concentration over time. And so what if we want to predict the concentration at a given time interval? Let's say we start at time zero and we want to know at time t how much concentration there's going to be. Or what if we want to know when the reaction is 95% complete, as in when you start it at maximum concentration, when does it go down to only 5% of that A remaining? And so these are really important in terms of predicting reactions. If you're a chemical engineer and you want to know, I need to make, you know, 10 moles of this, how long is that going to take me? It's going to depend on the rate of the reaction. But there's a problem with this. There's no time in these equations. I mean, there is a time and the, there's a change in time in this rate equation, but there's no T. And so we can't solve for T just using these equations here. We have to use something else to solve that. And the way we do that is with these integrated rate laws, also known as concentration time equations. And so for a zero order reaction, we have rate is equal to K and it's concentration of A to the zero. And if we do some calculus, we get an equation that looks like this. A is equal to negative K times T plus A naught. First order reaction, we have this equation. Second order reaction, we end up with this equation. And this is really useful, right? Because we have changed this equation into something that gives us the relationship between rate constant, which we, that's the intrinsic descriptor of the reaction. Time, which tells us, you know, we pick how long the reaction has gone. We have an initial concentration and a concentration at time t. And so again, you have four variables. If you know any three of these, you can calculate the other one. So if you know a rate constant and where you started and how long you've waited, you can figure out how much concentration is left. Likewise, if you have, you know, A and you know what t you want to get to or concentration at a given time you want to get to, and you have the rate constant, you can do the math and say, if I stop the reaction here, here, I will get that concentration. So again, a really convenient form because all of a sudden we have T in this reaction and your starting point and your ending point. And so I'll just briefly go through where this comes from. And so basically you have A going to B. We have a rate of the reaction, which is rate is equal to negative delta A over delta T. We have a rate law, which is rate is equal to K times the concentration of A. And so this tells us how fast A is disappearing. This tells us the mechanism with which it's happened. Rate is equal to K times the concentration of A. Now, if we set these guys equal and do a bit of calculus, which is showing up right here, we can actually convert this form into the, the uh, concentration time equation. And so that's essentially what we're doing. We're taking this rate, combining it with the reaction rate in terms of concentration of A, doing some calculus, and you end up with an equation that looks like this. You can do the same thing with a zero order reaction. Action. Same thing with rate, delta A over delta T. Rate is equal to K at zero order in A, so that disappears. Do some calculus, you get this answer here. Do the same thing with the second order rate, negative delta A over T, or delta A over delta T. Rate is equal to K A to the two. It's second order because there's a two there. And so do your calculus and you figure out that concentration time equation. And so I don't expect you guys to do the calculus, just know that we can take this, we can combine it with that rate expression, rate is equal to delta A over delta T, and we can do some calculus and come up with these much more convenient forms of these equations. And what's really cool about these, and if you guys haven't been excited about the color coding yet, is that these are essentially Y equals MX plus B equations, right? You have the slope, which is going to be the rate constant or negative rate constant. You have a relationship between T, concentration at time T, and your Y intercept is related to the initial concentration. And so essentially what this does 
is we have a uh, time concentration relationship, time concentration, time concentration. And so you have a graph that's going to give you a straight line if it's a first order, if it's a second order, if it's a zero order reaction. And so again, in all of these, time is the x-axis, the y-axis changes, in zero order it's just a, and first order it's natural log of a, in second order it is 1 over a. And again, the slope of the line is related to the, the rate constant, it's going to be negative in zero order in first order and positive in second order. And so when doing experiments, uh, can, uh, can chemical kinetics experimentally, essentially you want to figure out rate laws, you want to figure out concentration time relationships. And so what you essentially do is set up a reaction, measure the concentration over time, graph the results in a few different ways, and find the graph that generates a straight line. And that lets you determine the order of the rate law and k. And so previously when we were figuring out rate laws, we did it through varying the concentration, right? We changed the concentration of A and then uh, fixed the concentration of B and figured it out through inspection or through algebra. Well, it turns out you only need one data set. You just need the concentration change over time. And because we have those integrated rate laws, you can figure it out by graphing the data different ways. And so essentially we have a zero order graph, which is T times uh, T is the X axis. Well, T is the X axis in all these. And we have concentration in A, natural log of A, one over A. Essentially what you do is make an Excel spreadsheet. You say, okay, what's the concentration of A versus time? Graph that directly. Natural log of A, graph that one. 1 over A, graph that one. And what ends up, up what's going to happen is just due to the limitation of the mechanism of the reaction, at most, only one of these three graphs will give you a straight line. And that's because just mathematically, you can't have a straight line on more than one of these. And so essentially, if you graph the data and you find a straight line here, it tells you it's a first order reaction. It tells you the rate law for this reaction is rate is equal to K times the concentration of A. If you graph it this way and it's a straight line, it tells you rate is equal to K. And so this tells you not only what the rate law is, but it tells you the uh, rate constant as well, because the slope of the line is going to be proportional to that rate constant. And so yeah, this basically this is just a much easier way to find chemical kinetics and people do this experimentally rather than doing two different reactions where you have to vary concentration look how that affects the rate. Instead, you do one experiment and monitor the concentration A over time, graph it at three or more different ways. And that tells you which one gives you a straight line and that tells you what the rate law of the reaction is. All right, so changing directions a little bit, still using these integrated rate laws, but one convenient nomenclature people use to describe um, rate laws or rates of reactions is something called a half-life. And here's a formal definition, the amount of time required for a substance to re be reduced by 50%. And so this is in drug delivery, this is in radio uh, isotopic labeling. Uh, half-life, it turns out, is it's just a really simple number to describe how fast things are happening. And so if we take a reaction of A changing into something else we can graph a versus time and so the half-life is basically you know how much time does it take for half of it to disappear and so at the at time zero we have all our starting material after a given time interval half of that is gone time interval half of it is gone half of it is gone and that's what this is effectively saying it says at time zero all of it is there after one time interval or one half-life half of it after two, only a quarter. After three, an eighth. Basically, you're taking this number, dividing by two, that gives you the fraction remaining, and you can do the percent math. And so you can see very quickly, a lot of stuff goes away. Half of it, half of it, half of it. It's like walking halfway towards a wall. Eventually, you're going to basically get down to zero. And so the half-life in terms of mathematics is basically, it's the time when your concentration at a given time is A naught divided by two. So there's your initial concentration. You divide that by two, that is when you've reached the half-life because half of this is gone at a, that concentration at a T. That T is when the, the, the time interval has been a half-life. And so for a first order reaction, you can plug this essentially substituted into the equation because you know this AT is equal to, to A naught over uh, 2 and T is equal to 1 half. You do some algebra and you solve for this equation and you'll see here T 1 half, the time for 1 half is equal to 0 0.693 divided by K.
And so this basically tells you if you know the rate constant, you can figure out the half-life. If you know the time it takes for half of it to be gone, you can figure out the rate constant if you know it's a first-order reaction. If it's a zero-order reaction, it takes a different form. If it's a second-order reaction, it takes a different form. And so these are the half-life equations. And basically all we've done is we've taken the integrated rate laws or the concentration time equations, and we've substituted this into for a T on each one of these. We've substituted T one half for T on each one of these, and then we rearranged it to have T one half isolated on the left side. And so a big take home on this is that depending on the order of the reaction, the T one half can change. And so for a first order reaction, it turns out T one half is concentration independent. That half-life will always be the same for the first order reaction. And this turns out, this is why radioactive labeling works or why carbon dating works is because your T one half is always the same. It's not dictated by the concentration. But you can see for a zero order reaction, when you do that math, there is a concentration dependence. And so zero order reaction, the T one half changes proportionally to A naught. You can see a second order reaction, it's dependent on the concentration of A. And so half-life is a really useful descriptor. Um, for first order reaction, it's always constant. For second and zero order, it changes depending on the concentration of A. And so for zero order, as the concentration of A increases, the half-life increases. Um, for second order, as the concentration increases, the T one half decreases. And it's just proportional to this equation. As this number gets smaller, um, this number will get larger. And that's just how it's going to work. If this number gets larger, this number is going to get smaller. As this one goes up, this one goes up, this goes down, this goes down. But for a first order reaction, it doesn't matter what the concentration is, that half-life is always the same. And so, yeah, for a first order reaction, you get a graph like this. First half life, you lost half. Second half life, if you're down to a quarter. Uh, third half life, you're down to an eighth. It's going to be a, uh, a, your T1 half is going to be constant. And here you can see in graphical form why your half life changes for a zero order reaction. Remember, zero order is going to be a little straight line when you have concentration versus time. And you can see that straight line. There, you're decreasing by half. It's at that time interval right there. Decrease it by half again, it took you that much time. Decrease that by half again, it took you that much time. And so this is why the half-life is changing on a zero order reaction, because the um, time is shortening. Uh, alternatively, if you're gonna do a second order reaction, it's gonna look something like this, concentration versus time. The curve will look something like that. Um, the half-life actually becomes longer as the reaction progresses. And so yeah, it's just it's just a manifestation of how does concentration change with time with respect to order of the reaction, and so yeah, there's your different uh, half life equations. That's why the half life changes on second order and zero order, but not on first order reactions. All right, so there's our summary. Rate laws are great. Rate laws give us a lot of information, uh, but integrated rate laws also give us the relationship between time and concentration. So if you know three of the variables, you can calculate the fourth. Also, we only need to do one measurement and we can graph it several different ways to figure out what the rate law or the order of the reaction is at the very least. We also have this half-life, which is just a convenient, you know, numerical definition. You could do three quarter life, you could do 80% life, you could do anything you want. Uh, the common in the field, either, either medicine or radioactivity is half-life of the material. And so we have very specific half-life equations. And so half-life of a first order reaction is concentration independent. Half-life of a zero and second order uh, reaction changes um, depending on the um, concentration of your starting material. And so yeah, that closes out integrated rate laws. Uh, now we're going to start diving into things like collision theory, reaction mechanism, as well as catalysis.